There are plenty of existential threats facing humanity. Some are not at all unlikely, but they may just reduce our numbers. Other threatening scenarios are less likely to occur, but may have the potential to wipe out humanity in its entirety. On our top 10 list of disasters which may wipe out humanity this century, threats from nature occupy spots 10 through 6. I have survived asteroid impacts, climate fluctuations, etc, etc. It doesn't seem very likely that one of those would do us in within the next 100 years. And therefore, I believe that if we go extinct within the next 100 years, it is much more likely to be as a result of anthropogenic risks, risks of our own doing. From a distance, the city of Pripyat looks like any other concrete city built in the Ukraine during the 1970s. But as you get up close, it's clear that something is amiss here. Not that long ago, tens of thousands of people lived here, but it was turned into a ghost city by a catastrophe caused by man. So now we're pretty close to the reactor unit number four. We'll make stop on the... The technicians at the nuclear power plant in Chernobyl did not wish to cause a disaster. They were simply experimenting to find out what would happen if they ran the power plant's turbines without an external power supply. The meltdown at Chernobyl on April 26, 1986, released high levels of radiation, rendering the area uninhabitable for centuries to come. The question is, could we cause even greater devastation? A disaster so serious that it would completely wipe us out. Three weeks before the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, the first nuclear weapons test ever was conducted in the desert in New Mexico. The so-called Trinity test on July the 16th, 1945, had caused a certain level of anxiety beforehand. As early as 1942, physicist Edward Teller argued that an atomic bomb could, in theory, start a chain reaction which would ignite the entire world's atmosphere. It's a little nuclear reaction happening in the bomb, but maybe all the atoms in the atmosphere could also sort of be dragged into this chain reaction. Uh, and the concern was taken seriously enough that there was actually a report commissioned uh, and some physicists were set at the task of calculating whether this would happen. Scientists now know what it would take for Teller's doomsday scenario to become a reality. But at the time of the Trinity test, the physical effects had not been fully explored. In spite of this, the test was carried out. We now know it was physically impossible for it to happen. But it's still interesting to reflect just how confident would you have to be in your calculation in order for you to be willing to risk humanity's future on its correctness. Today, scientists are conducting other kinds of physics experiments. At CERN, outside Geneva, they have constructed an enormous particle accelerator in order to conduct experiments involving unprecedented energy levels. So this is the, the room from which we uh, run and record uh, good data uh, coming from the, the collision of the two LHC beams. In a 27 kilometer long tunnel, large magnets are used to accelerate protons to nearly the speed of light. As they collide, new particles are formed and scientists hope that they'll help us to understand the makeup of the universe. This footage is from March the 30th, 2010. People are excited about the particle accelerator just having set an unprecedented record. 
For the first time, uh, two beams were accelerated up to 3.5 TV per beam, and we immediately saw in our detectors the results of these uh, uh, unprecedented collisions producing a sprays of particles in the, uh, in the experiment. And clearly, we had the awareness that the new era in particle physics has started with exploration of a new territory. But there are those who believe that the experiments in Geneva will bring about the end of the world. The scientific progress that the Large Hadron Collider represents is, is enormous benefit, not only to particle physics, but to all kinds of theoretical physics. But we also want to make sure that the risks are assessed and known before we go forward with this. The cost of an undesired outcome is incredibly large. In this case, it would be the loss of the entire planet. And therefore, a number of people felt it was their civic duty, to, their duty to the Earth, to the humanity, to put a halt to things until this evaluation could be done properly. And Wagner has got support from this German professor. A physicist should always bend over backwards to try to find the weakest points in his own ideas. So I'm just one of those people who say, play it carefully. Otto Rössler maintains that the scientists at CERN took a risk on that day in March 2010. The energy of these collisions was raised by a factor of four uh, against my warnings uh, this year. And when these numbers become as high as planned, I once calculated a risk of about 8% that the Earth might be, uh, how should I say, shrunk to two centimeters in a few years' time. Several different scenarios um, have been proposed for how high energy physics experiments, um, such as those taking place in the Large Hydron Collider, um, could potentially pose an existential risk to humanity. The probability of having a resident black hole inside Earth. And this probability Otto Rustman is a professor of mathematics. This is the energy. And according to his calculations, the colliding particles could cause small luminosity. black holes to form. In this field of black hole theory, uh, still new discoveries can be made. And uh, I believe that my group made a discovery in that area. And black holes might be formed, very tiny ones, if at enough, high enough energies of collision. So far, the accelerator is only run at energy levels which Rustler sees as acceptable. But this is about to change. We are making huge steps to go up in the intensity of the, of the two beams. And actually, these days, we are making yet another step of a factor of two or three more intensity in the, uh, in the collisions. And this is what concerns me, because my results say that in this area there is a certain finite probability of disaster. Black holes are regions in space where gravity is so strong that not even light can escape. It is believed that there are large black holes in the centre of galaxies, and that stars collapse into medium-sized black holes when they eventually run out of fuel. But in theory, a black hole could be infinitely small, and in that case, one could be created in Geneva. According to Fabiola Ginotti, that's exactly what they're hoping to accomplish there. Let me tell it right away that production of mini black holes will be a very important, a very nice discovery. So we are keen, actually, to produce black holes. They are, they are, these are particles that can be uh, produced if there exist uh, additional uh, dimensions and microscopic additional dimensions. Then production of mini black holes could be possible, but these mini black holes uh, evaporate instantly and so they will be completely, they will be completely harmless. But Rössler argues that man-made black holes would have properties not found in black holes in space. Uh, my results show that these little black holes will not disappear and if they happen to be slow enough to stay inside Earth, they will eventually eat the Earth from the inside out. And the question then is only how long this will take. In Ressler's doomsday scenario, the man-made black hole would drop right through the particle accelerator's containment field. Gravity would pull the hole towards the center of the Earth, where it would grow larger by absorbing the atoms surrounding it. First, slowly, and then at an ever-increasing rate. It, it would just have the features of a quasar, meaning it would have two, two jets coming out in two directions, which eventually would come out of the Earth in both directions, and then people would know that there is this active machine inside, which is going to eat it inside out in all that short time. The people at CERN acknowledge that man-made black holes may behave in ways which are difficult to predict. 
but they don't believe that we are at risk. You're right, we don't know what the outcome will be, but the fact that this experiment, which we do at the LHC, nature has been doing that for four and a half billion years, means that whatever is produced, which we do not know, is not dangerous for us. The risk that the scientists in Geneva might conduct a doomsday experiment is most likely non-existent. So far, no other prominent physicist shares Rösler's concerns regarding man-made miniature black holes. But no one knows what future scientists might construct in an effort to tame the force of nature. On our top 10 list of existential threats, dangerous physics experiments occupy the number 5 spot. Physics experiments may come under the category of theoretical threats, but our next scenario is very tangible indeed. It's summertime in Antarctica in January 1909. Polar explorer Ernest Shackleton has just abandoned his efforts to reach the South Pole. On his way back to the base camp, he discovers something that will radically alter our perception of this icy continent. A piece of fossilized wood. And he also finds a piece of sandstone bearing the clear imprint of a plant. There can only be one possible explanation for the presence of these items. This now sterile environment was once the site of a tropical forest. The climate of the Earth varies over time. A fact not well understood in Shackleton's time, but something we now know to be a fact. At times, the Earth's surface has become entirely frozen, and there have been warm periods, for example, the one known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. Biological diversity was reduced in the heat around the equator, and life made its way towards the polar regions. There was no ice in the world, no ice sheets. Antarctica and Greenland were not covered by ice, and we know that in, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, there were actually uh, uh, crocodiles living and palm trees. We are now heading towards a new warm period and this time we're the ones causing it. What we're doing is gambling with a planetary life support system and we're talking about an experiment on the real earth with us and all the other living things along for the ride. What we don't know is do we have a decade before it's too late or do we have a century? The signs of global warming are clear and virtually all climate scientists now agree that we are facing serious changes to our climate. I wouldn't rule out right now that the melting that you can already see on Greenland has already created an irreversible situation that we won't even know is an irreversible situation for 25 to 50 more years. And then once it starts, you can't stop it. And that's what we call a tipping point. Scientists know that we may experience a sharp rise in temperature based on their studies of prehistoric times. Around the time when Shackleton's finds were deposited, 55 million years ago, something happened which led to a sharp rise in global temperatures. There was a, a, a warming which, which took place relatively rapidly, as rapidly perhaps as the warming that we're causing now by putting more CO2 into the atmosphere. We associate the greenhouse effect with the tiny molecule called carbon dioxide, but there are even more powerful greenhouse gases. Methane is 20 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas, and it's believed that a sudden rise in the level of methane in the atmosphere set the stage for the warming 55 million years ago. Climate scientists fear that we'll reach a tipping point where the dormant methane is brought back to life. The greatest deposits of methane on Earth are found here, in the Siberian tundra and on the bottom of the East Siberian Sea. And no place on Earth is experiencing a sharper rise in temperature right now. It's not a good combination. Erjan Gustafsson at Stockholm University has recently been on an expedition to the East Siberian Sea. The consensus used to be that the permafrost kept the methane locked at the bottom of the sea. But Gustafsson found this not to be the case. So it took thousands of tests on many different places over this huge area. And we found, in contrast to what tidigare hade trott att metan släpps fritt så det släpps fritt över ungefär hälften av den här stora ytan. Mängderna som, av metan som flödar ut i atmosfären är i storleksordning 8 miljoner ton eh, per år. 
No one knows at which point we'll cross the tipping point and cause devastating amounts of methane to be released. It all depends on whether or not we're able to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases. Prior to the industrialization of 150 years ago, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 270 parts per million. Today, it's 390. That's an increase of almost 50%. Carbon dioxide emissions have been going up, up, up. If we continue on this fast track that we're on, we're probably heading up toward 800 to 1,000 ppm at the end of the century, which I would not hesitate to consider very likely to be a catastrophic scenario. Stephen Schneider is one of the main authors for the United Nations Climate Panel. He's been looking at how the planet would react if a disaster scenario were to occur. Well, with 1,000 ppm, we would probably warm up somewhere more than 4 degrees Celsius, maybe as high as 6 or 8. There would be major deglaciation of Greenland, 5 to 10 meters of sea level rise, intensified hurricanes, super fires, up to 40% of known species could be driven to extinction, really bad floods in Europe, you know, goodbye Venice, and everybody will say, what have we done? But could climate change render the planet uninhabitable and cause humanity to be wiped out? Well, I'm not the biggest pessimist in this. I have colleagues who actually think that this worst case scenario would drive humans to extinction. It would cause the outgassing of all the methane in the tundra and under the oceans, and that instead of warming up the equivalent of 1,000 ppm, we'd go twice that. In the future, we may face a crisis and be forced to employ extreme measures. Yes, yeah, so this is the idea of uh, deliberately changing the Earth's climate. For example, by injecting soot into the atmosphere or by building mirrors in space that would block out some of the sunlight. What is called geoengineering involves employing technical solutions to stop the planet from warming. It's like a plan B in case we are unable to reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide. But many believe that geoengineering could actually make things worse. Geoengineering projects uh, could cause their own risks. Um, we know that when human beings begin to muck around with complex systems that we don't understand very well, it often turns out our interventions have side effects. What are you going to do if there are side effects that you can never prove how much of it you contributed to? You have a risk where the cure is worse than the disease, so it's a very, very dangerous experiment. It's not likely that humans could cause a climate disaster that would render the planet uninhabitable, no matter how hard we try. But in the worst case scenario, we may be forced to do what animals and plants did 55 million years ago and move to an ice-free Antarctica. I would say that this is probably a larger risk than any of the ones we have previously considered here impact hazards, the super volcanoes, or even perhaps the physics experiments. That's why the threat of climate collapse ranks as number four on our doomsday list. No threat has been more tangible in recent times than this next one. October 1961. A Tupolev bomber is heading towards the Arctic Ocean. Major Andrei Dunotsev is in charge of a weapons test, the magnitude of which the world has never seen, before or since. The plane's cargo is the most powerful bomb ever built, the so-called Tsar bomb. It has a yield of 50 megatons and is more than 3,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. The mushroom cloud reaches an altitude of more than 60 kilometers, and the shock wave travels around the world three times before subsiding. The Tsar bomb was dropped during the height of the Cold War, six months after the Bay of Pigs invasion and one year before the Cuban Missile Crisis conflicts which could have led to the start of World War III. 
At one point, there were more than 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Today's nuclear arsenals are much smaller, but there are still thousands of American and Russian missiles that can be launched by simply pushing a button. This dot represents the total explosive power of all the bombs used during World War II. Two to three megatons explosive power, during which 50 million people died. The rest is the current, ex the equivalent explosive power of the current nuclear arsenal. One would think that the explosive force and the deadly levels of radiation would pose the greatest threats in the event of a nuclear war. But the most serious consequences for humanity would be caused by something else. A nuclear bomb is like bringing a piece of the sun to the earth for a fraction of a second. It's so bright that it's like a match. It will light on fire anything around within 10 kilometers or so. And it's the smoke from these fires that would last in the upper atmosphere for a number of years that would absorb sunlight and make it cold and dark at the Earth's surface that would cause the climate to change. The sound of bombs exploding fades away and is replaced by silence as a devastating cloud rises up into the sky. Alan Robock's work shows that today's nuclear arsenal would indeed be sufficient to cause a radioactive winter. This is the smoke and how it would be distributed around the world. The winds would, would blow it around the world and it would, within two weeks, cover the entire planet. So it doesn't really matter where the smoke would go in, it would then uh, uh, be distributed by the winds and cover almost the entire inhabited part of the planet within a couple weeks. According to this simulation, temperatures wouldn't even rise above freezing during summertime. So this is the, the first summer after the smoke, this is the second summer after the smoke, and the third summer that the temperatures would be below freezing the whole time. So we really truly got nuclear winter. Agriculture would come to a halt, it would get cold and dark and dry, and most of the world would, pam would perish from famine. The Cold War came to an end in the early 1990s, and the political situation is a lot less tense now but one cannot dismiss the threat from possible future conflicts. We shouldn't uh, delude ourselves to thinking that because the Cold War um, passed without any nuclear incidents, therefore we are safe from the peril of nuclear war. One thing is certain. Technological advances will result in newer and more powerful weapons. Future weapons may employ science that we cannot even see. Nanotechnology is about manipulating matter on an atomic and molecular scale. Working at the nano level enables us to make things stronger, more durable and more flexible. And it can also make it easier to fight diseases and environmental problems. Basically it's a very, very powerful technology once it's developed, which could be used to do a lot of good or a lot of uh, evil. Nanotechnology has a darker side. There's already been talk about creating nano weapons. There are many, many foreseeable weapon systems. One of many examples of the kind of weapon that could be built is uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous flyers the size of mosquitoes, but each one capable of killing an unprotected human. You could imagine maybe some canister that releases little robots that can fly and seek out humans and inject them with poison. They land on the human, they inject you, you're dead. The prototype for this scenario already exists. Autonomous flying machines are becoming ever smaller and more intelligent. And it's possible to envision an even more frightening scenario. You could imagine microscopic bacteria-like nanotechnological uh, machines that would be capable of harvesting resources from the natural environment and that could proliferate uncontrollably. An armada of bacteria-sized machines could devastate enemy territory by consuming everything in their way. This is still far beyond the bounds of current science but cannot be completely ruled out. This, I think, is one of the major existential risks. It's zero right now in the sense that we don't currently have the kind of nanotech weapons that could pose a threat 
to humanity. This is a future existential risk. Are we going to build a weapon system that collectively could destroy the world, as our nuclear arsenal could? Uh, the answer to that is maybe. And the danger is still being analyzed. Uh, but I think it'll be a long time before we get to the point where a, a random madman or terrorist would be able to build a, a doomsday weapon out of molecular manufactured components. World War I was called the Chemist's War. Tear gas, mustard gas and chlorine gas were produced for use on the battlefields of Europe. World War II gave us the atomic bomb. Which weapons World War III will be fought with, no one knows. So Einstein once said, I don't know with which weapons the Third World War will be fought, but the Fourth World War will be fought with sticks and stones. This is a category of different specific risks. Risks with nuclear weapons, risks with nanotech weapons, risks with weapons that haven't yet been invented. And so the overall likelihood that an existential disaster will occur as a result of a war uh, seems fairly high. The threat from a doomsday war ranks as number three on our list. In spot number two, we find a threat that still belongs in the category of science fiction. It was thought to be impossible until it actually happened in 1997. A computer defeats the reigning world chess champion. Jag är absolut mest uppmärksamma och omskrivna partiet i datorskärkhistorien. Så är det den det andra partiet mellan Kaspar och Deep Blue, 4 maj 1997 i New York. Inget annat parti har varit i närheten. The supercomputer Deep Blue makes a move that catches Gary Kasparov completely off guard. Kasparov sets a trap, certain that the computer will fall for it. But the computer doesn't behave like those he's played against before. After two minutes of calculations, Deep Blue decides on a move that sets the stage for the world champion's downfall. Move 37 is completely unexpected. And later, Kasparov could only state that the machine seemed to have displayed human intelligence. It's not an exaggeration to state that we've entered the age of the machine. It would be impossible for us to go back to a world without computers and automation. Machines are essential for managing air traffic control, maintaining nuclear power plants, handling global communications and controlling the world economy. Without them, our civilization would crumble. Those who fear that we're already at the mercy of machines will find even more things to fear in the future. There will be more machines and they'll become even more advanced. PR2 can open a door, can plug itself in, uh, can grab a drink out of a fridge and fold towel. We have it doing a whole variety of different things. Willow Garage in Silicon Valley develops tomorrow's household appliances. Here they are certain that robots will become just as common as dishwashers or computers are today. This is the room where we do all the assembly. We build all the robots. We think they can improve people's productivity. We think they can improve people's quality of life. Uh, I think you'll see them in your house. You'll see them at work. A dishwasher is an excellent dishwashing robot. It's just not general purpose. If you could have that be a general purpose robot that could wash the dishes and could put them in the cupboard and could take them down off the shelf, all of a sudden that has a lot more value to somebody. But could machines become sufficiently advanced and be given enough control so that they might become a threat to us? Could they turn on us, like we've seen in science fiction? Today's robots are still childlike. They've barely learned how to walk. But we can guess what the future will bring. It's not hard to imagine that robots could handle weapons and not just drinks and footballs. The military has long had unmanned aerial vehicles. Now ground robots are appearing on the battlefield. Military robots are becoming so common that conferences are organized to discuss the ethical problems resulting from using robots in times of war. 
people don't realise how many there are. There were very few in 2001, but now there's something like 7,000 robots being deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq. But the ones, and these are used for surveillance, they're used for bomb disposal, and we don't really object to those. What we really object to is weaponized, what we call weaponized platforms. That's robots carrying weapons. These can be remote controlled, but they can also operate completely on their own. When the robot spots a target, it sets up a firing solution within a fraction of a second. Then it waits, so far anyway, for a human order to fire. Part of the reason why these systems are autonomous is that there is a change in the tempo of warfare. There's no longer time to uh, consult with humans sometime about uh, engaging a target. Uh, that's a, a very serious uh, concern. The question is, what level of authority are we going to give to these systems in terms of deciding whether to engage a target or not? But for fiction to become fact, and for the machines to turn on us, it will take more than brute force. They will have to become intelligent. The scientific community is split on the issue of the possibility of creating artificial intelligence, or AI. Ben Goetzel is among those who argue that machines will not only reach our level, but that they will surpass us. I would say it's 99% likely, or more, that within the next century, AIs will become massively more intelligent and more powerful than people, so that we're no longer the top dogs on the planet. A brand new research strategy has raised expectations among advocates of AI. Scientists are now attempting to create a digital version of the human brain. Piece by piece, the brain is being converted into ones and zeros. Synapse by synapse, brain cell by brain cell. If the effort is successful, the digital mind could be able to outperform its biological counterpart. I think digital minds can be better than human brains in a number of dimensions. They can be more intelligent, they can be more ethical than human beings, and they can also be more adept at modifying and improving themselves. A super-intelligent machine could handle all the planet's processes more efficiently than today's computer systems. But collaborating with machines could turn out to be a dangerous gamble. This, I would put either at or very near the top of the list of existential risks. We can't rule out completely a scenario where we create AIs with goals that seem good to us, but later turn out to have been the wrong goal. This might seem weird. It seems perhaps like pure science fiction, but a superintelligence would be able to very, very quickly develop all kinds of very powerful technologies that it could use to implement its will, whatever it be there's a chance that a digital mind could turn on us, and we can't be sure that we'll be able to put a stop to it in time. So you might think, well, if it starts doing harmful things, you can just pull the plug on the superintelligence. Now, this is an action that the superintelligence could anticipate that we might take. So it will view the scenario in which the plug is pulled as a complete failure to realize its goals, and therefore, take actions to prevent this from occurring. Maybe by hacking its way out to the internet so it can make backup copies of itself all over the place. Maybe by taking control of some robotic manipulators and it could then use that to take power. If we object, the artificial intelligence could employ the robots of the future to keep our hands away from the off switch. And if we take up arms, well then it might decide it would be simpler to rid itself of these biological troublemakers. Basically, by the time you have a, a superintelligence that is hostile to us or indifferent to our welfare, uh, the only safe assumption is that by that time you've already lost. And therefore, what you gotta do is make sure that the first time you build a superintelligence, it's a friendly superintelligence. Um, with something like this, as indeed with all existential catastrophes, you only get one shot at getting it right. The threat from super-intelligent machines is at number two on our list of existential threats. We've reached the number one spot on our list of doomsday scenarios.
It was a Friday like any other in March 1979. But before the day's end, the staff at Military Compound 19 in the Soviet city of Sverdlovsk would cause a horrible accident. A technician removed a filter from a ventilation pipe. He noted this, but the people working the next shift failed to notice. While the filter was removed, spores of anthrax leaked out through the ventilation pipe. The official number is about 80 people died, but unofficially we, su we suspect that about 300 people died in this accident. The employees at the ceramic plant across the street were the worst hit. Most of the people who worked there that day would die within a week as a result of what became known as the biological Chernobyl. The superpowers of the Cold War have officially dismantled their biological weapon programs, but the ability to produce deadly microorganisms has not disappeared. The Soviet Union produced hundreds of tons, you won't believe me, the hundreds of tons of biological weapons, enough to kill the whole population of Earth. Uh, based on this historical example, we can project that the country with relatively moderate resources could, could produce a large amount of biological weapons. By manipulating the genetic code, it's now possible to create new life forms. The research field is called synthetic biology, and many hope that this will help humanity deal with a wide range of problems. People are actually interested in using uh, synthetic biology to go and seek out tumors in the body to clean up uh, sites that have, have radiation. And, and so it's kind of your imagination is, is the limit for the field of synthetic biology. But it's the hope that we'll be able to develop a new fuel for our cars and aeroplanes once we run out of oil that is currently driving major investments in this field. This grass will be genetically modified so that it will grow faster and taller. Then a super bacteria will be created that can convert the grass into biofuel. So the goal, the goal is really to be able to cut and paste genes from any organism to make a renewable fuel. The powerful potential of this technology has also led to a good deal of concern. There are a lot of risks. You can't be 100% sure that we aren't going to release accidentally a microbe that we've genetically modified into the environment. Um, and so there are also efforts to engineer in automatic death circuits uh, so that these microbes essentially kill themselves if they're uh, released into the environment. But what most fear isn't that disaster will strike by accident. The potential for deliberate destruction is even greater. These two men caused a heated discussion about research ethics when they used synthetic biology to produce a dangerous virus. Eckhard Wimmer and John Mocello downloaded the genetic makeup of the polio virus from the internet and acquired the DNA sequences by mail order. Using standard university lab equipment, they were able to bring the polio virus back to life. It became suddenly very clear that if you can do this with a small virus like polio virus, you may be able to do it one day with smallpox virus. Their intent was not to spread the polio virus. They just wanted to demonstrate that it could easily be created. People were shocked. It was of great concern to the public that it would be misused. With the growing technological powers, particularly the DNA synthesis machines and other techniques, we are right now going down a path where these kinds of capabilities will become available to anybody who wants to buy them for you know, a few thousand dollars secondhand on eBay. So 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, unless something is done to stop this, anybody could be able to print out their own version of the smallpox virus or Ebola virus. In the 21st century, synthetic biology appears to be the greatest threat to mankind, and it is at the top of our doomsday list.
our top 10 list of doomsday scenarios is thereby complete. But there is actually one remaining threat that could be more serious than all of the others combined. There is an 11th card in the deck. Pripyat gives us the chance to observe one possible future. It shows us what a world without humans might look like. Whether mankind's journey will be long or short could depend on our ability to survive this century. If we make it through, from that point on, the risk of human extinction and existential catastrophe might decline and the lifespan for the human species at that point might become extremely long and the future of humanity could be far, far greater than our past. The End of the World season continues tomorrow at 9 with brand new Omens of the Apocalypse. Stay tuned for 2012, The Final Prophecy.